just to acknowledge um, the support the Institute gets from the province of Ontario. Um, and um, also special thanks to the staff members at each of the six hospitals that we worked with who did a lot of work with us, uh, preparing ethics applications, um, gave us input on the survey that we were implementing and also helped disseminate the survey to their staff members. And also uh, this work came from uh, a group that I was co-chairing as part of the violence, uh, violence prevention in healthcare uh, panel, the, the leadership panel. I was co-chairing the Indicators Evaluation and Reporting Working Group with Anna Greenberg at Health Quality Ontario and Amber Belecki, who was formerly at IWH, uh, Maggie DeVeers and Michael Beckett did a lot of work in terms of some of the background work behind this presentation and uh, supporting this working group. So the starting point for where the work today comes from is around um, the new mandatory indicator. So starting in a, a couple of, I guess, you know, maybe a couple of weeks, um, Health Quality Ontario will be publicly disseminating the number of workplace violent incidents that are reported from each hospital across Ontario. Um, hospital incidents as recorded in a hospital reporting system are also valuable sources of information for the hospital themselves as they plan um, violence prevention activities as in terms of evaluating if they've been successful in reducing the number of violent incidents on a year-by-year -year basis. But certainly um, the, the um, quality of the information that's reported in hospital systems is going to become more important in Ontario as we both compare hospitals to each other and as we examine how workplace violence prevention activities in healthcare have uh, been effective over time. In terms of the technical specifications of the new mandatory indicator, um, which is the number of workplace violent incidents, the unit of measurement will be the number of incidents that are reported by hospital workers within a 12-month period. Um, the workplace, workplace violence that should be reported is all those types of violence which are defined under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And I'm going to give you a definition in just a second. Do you want me to move that a bit closer? Um, and the data source, as I mentioned before, will be in-house in data collection, so the number of incidents that the hospital reports in their, in their system. So workplace violence under the Ontario Health and Safety Act comprises of three distinct activities. One is where physical force has been exercised against a person uh, in a workplace that causes or could cause physical injury. Um, also included under the definition in the Act are attempts of violence, so where violence doesn't actually occur but it's attempted or nothing, physical injury doesn't actually occur and physical connections are not being made. But also statements or behaviours that are, it's reasonable for a worker to interpret as a threat um, is considered workplace violence and should be considered workplace violence under the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act. And so all, each of these incidents should be reported to the hospital reporting system. Um, in fact, in any workplace, each of these incidents should be reported uh, in any workplace. So in terms of understanding how well a hospital system will capture all types of workplace violence that occur within the hospital, um, there isn't any information up until today um, about how that would happen in Ontario, how much how many incidents get reported in Ontario. But uh, there are two recent studies um, from the US, one by Judy Arnett's, which looked at 42 hospital units in the Midwest United States, and one by Lisa Pompeo, which looked at two large hospital systems in Texas and North Carolina. And each of these studies we became aware of as we were working with the data indicators and evaluation working group about what, what would actually re be reported in a hospital system around workplace violence. Um, the sample sizes and the response rates differ a little bit in the two studies. You can see that in the Arnett study, um, there was 446 people who participated with a response rate of 22%. In the Pompeii study, there was just over 5,000 people who, responsi who responded, a response rate of over just under 50%. Um, the, Pomp uh, the Arnett study looked at all types of violence. So in terms of workplace violence, it's often distinguished between four different types of violence type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4. Um, type 2 violence is, is a patient or visitor violence where the other types of violence is if it's a, a client um, uh, or if it's a family member or if it's someone who, or a colleague, someone who's known to the worker. In terms of the um, experiences of violence, you can see again it differs a little bit. 62% of the sample in the Arnett study experienced violence and 39% of the um, sample in the Pompeii study experienced violence. 
In terms of the reporting, so they asked people if they reported violence in some way, so did you tell a colleague, did you tell a family member, um, did you tell uh, a friend, uh, your supervisor, um, and also did you report that to the hospital system? So was it captured in the hospital system at the end of the day? Um, or did you not tell anyone? You just kept it to yourself. So you can see in the Arnett study, 12% of people actually reported to the hospital system with another 40% reporting it in some other way. So they didn't report it to the hospital system, but they might have told a supervisor, or they might have just told their partner when they got home. But um, almost half in the Arnett study didn't report it at all, just didn't tell anyone. Um, in terms of the Pompeii study, 9% reported to the hospital system. 66% um, reported it to someone else. So 75% of the sample reported to somebody, um, but again, only a small proportion of those actually reported it to the hospital system. So we wanted to know, well, what does it look like in Ontario? If we're going to use this as a mandatory indicator, we know that hospitals are already using reports of violence as part of how one of their metrics of, of if they should be worried about workplace violence and if their prevention activities have been successful. So how many of the events of workplace violence that occur in hospitals in Ontario actually end up in a hospital system? So our objective was working together with six Ontario hospitals. I'm going to describe the hospitals generally, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. Um, we wanted to estimate self-reported rates of different types of workplace violence, so looking at assaults, attempted assaults and threats um, in the previous 12 months. We wanted to understand how many of these incidents were reported to the hospital system and also to examine perceptions of workplace violence prevention activities. So one of the things that we set out to do was not take the assumption that when violence reports are low, the workplace violence prevention perceptions must be high. Uh, we wanted to really understand what would each of these different metrics tell us. And for the most serious incident, we asked people to tell us a little bit more about what were the consequences of that incident, uh, what resulted from that incident, um, if it was reported to the hospital system, and if it wasn't, why didn't they report it? So getting into more details about why they didn't report it to the hospital system. So. Uh, in terms of the study timeline, this study started with some engagement with the hospitals in late 2016 uh, through to March 2017. Uh, we submitted various ethics applications between March and, uh, and June um, with the University of Toronto and with each of the hospitals. Um, we looked, we had participatory approaches to asking about the survey content with each of the different hospitals. Um, and then we started the surveys in late October, late November last year. We kept them open for a four to five week period. We closed the surveys at the end of December um, and then we've analysed the data and I'm going to report that to you today. In terms of the hospitals to describe them, they would all be uh, considered to be either very large or large volume um, community, community based hospitals. Um, there was teaching hospitals which were part of that. Uh, they all live in what we would call um, like very, very urban or ur urban areas. Um, so all very similar sizes, all about two to 3,000 full-time equivalents, um, receiving about 20,000 or more hospital admissions each year. So large hospitals, very similar reporting systems um, and serving similar volume um, in terms of the population. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, in terms of the survey content, the survey we could divide into three different parts. One was we just asked everyone about, have you experienced workplace violence? How many times have you experienced each of the different types of violence? And how many of these incidents did you report to the hospital system? And at that point, they could stop doing the survey if they wanted, um, or if they wanted to, we'd skip them to part, if they hadn't experienced violence, we would skip them to part three, where we asked about violence prevention um, and also demographic information. For people who had experienced violence, we asked them to tell us a little bit more about this most serious incident of workplace violence. So this is where we asked them about what was it, um, what type of violence was it, who did it, um, what were the consequences of the violence. Um, all surveys were done online following a mass email to staff. They were done towards the end of the year. Um, it wasn't the best time to do it, but we did want to make sure we had the surveys completed before um, the mandatory indicator sort of came into place because um, one of the, I hope, the intended consequences of having a mandatory indicator of violence, which each hospital has to report, is that it actually might stimulate reporting across the hospitals because now it's not just the hospitals which are capturing and reporting that information, but it's publicly disseminated as well. So in terms of the sample size, so this is for the first part of the survey where we just asked everyone to complete the information. Um, we had, so here are the six different hospitals down on the bottom, A, B, C, D, E and F. Um, as I said, all the hospitals are a similar base size. 
these sizes for this particular survey represent response rates of somewhere between 5% and 15%. Um, in, an epi in a quantitative survey, we don't think 15% is a good response rate, so I won't tell you what we think 5% is. Um, but it's, um, but it, is, it is what it is, so it's a lot of information. And as a result, um, when I get towards the most serious parts of violence, we will just group all the information together because we don't have enough to start comparing hospitals to each other. Um, the grey is the information we could use, and the blue is a lot of people did the survey. Um, well, I don't know why they did the survey. Opened it up, but didn't give us any information. We did have a prize draw, so if you open the survey, you're eligible to enter a prize draw if you wanted to give us information. Maybe that might be the case. It could just be people just having a look um, at the survey content and deciding they didn't want to answer it. Um, but you can see we have a variety of different um, response patterns. Um, all in all, we have just over 1,300 people where we've got some type of information on their experiences of workplace violence. I'm going to keep it fairly descriptive today in terms of presenting the information. Um, I will tell you that in terms of the proportion across each hospital that worked in direct care, it was always around 80%. In terms of the proportion that was female, it was again around 80%, which is typical of what you'd expect in this particular sector. Um, the age ranges didn't, di uh, didn't differ in terms of the proportion it was over 45 years of age, it was around 50%, and about 50% had more than 10 years of experience. These didn't differ a lot across the hospital, so I haven't done any adjustment, but I can tell you that any differences you see today are unlikely to be due to any of these factors, uh, because they're not really different across the hospitals that we surveyed. So the first thing we asked people was about um, have you experienced violence? Have you experienced a physical assault? Have you experienced an attempted assault? Have you experienced a threat? We gave them the definitions that are listed under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, and then we also, if someone had experienced one or more of these types of events, we said they've experienced some type of workplace violence. You can see here that there is a bit of a range across the hospitals in terms of physical assaults. It ranges from about 15% to about 26 27%. Um, and across each hospital, you can see a pattern whereby physical assaults occur less frequently than attempted assaults, and threats occur more frequently than attempted assaults or physical assaults. In terms of experiencing workplace violence, again, the range is somewhere between <laughs> just over 30% and almost 50% of our sample had, had experienced some type of workplace violence in the previous 12 months. So in terms of the reporting of workplace violence, um, we asked them, you know, so have you experienced three types, three incidents of assault, um, how many of those did you report? And they could say, well, I reported none, I reported one or two, or I reported all of them, I reported three of them. And here you can see in terms of the reports, um, so in terms of physical assaults, 24% reported all the physical assaults that they <laughs> experienced, um, with another 31% reporting some of the assaults that they experienced, but not all of them. And 46% um, reporting none of the assaults they experienced. And we can see again a, a pattern whereby um, attempted assaults are reported less frequently than physical assaults, and threats are reported least frequently of all, with only 8.5% of people reporting all the threats they received, um, and 27, 28% uh, of people reporting some of the events they've seen. And we, you know, often there are studies which show that the more frequently you experience an event, the less likely you are to report each of those events. And this could be a play here or it could be because uh, they're thought to be less serious. But certainly um, we don't capture all types of uh, events, workplace violence events that are occurring um, in these six large, very similar hospitals. In terms of looking at the distribution across the hospitals, you can see that, um, so again, A, B, C, D, E and F are the hospitals. I've now had to group um, some, and, some or all events because we had very small sample sizes and we don't want to um, run into issues around data suppression. Um, but you can see in terms of no events being reported or even just some or all events being reported, the range is quite different. So it ranges from about 35% in this hospital where no events are reported. This is just physical assaults, by the way. 35% to about 73%. So that's more than double. So you could have two hospitals with the same hospital system report, but hospital B 
has doubled the actual rates of violence compared to Hospital A. Or you could have um, two hospitals which have the same experience of workplace violence, but Hospital B reports half of them as their hospital report at the end of the year. Um, so this variation is a concern because these hospitals, as I said, are similar in size, um, same or almost identical reporting system, um, very similar in terms of they're all 24-hour emergency departments, they all have um, long-term care beds, um, and yet we're seeing two-fold differences in reports that go into the hospital system, which tends to suggest there might be a lot of variation in the hospital reports that isn't true variation in the incidence of workplace violence. Um, so now I'm going to go to part two of the survey, which is where we asked about the most serious event. Um, I will just add before I do that, so we saw um, in terms of the variation across the hospital, for physical assaults, that's where the variation was the greatest. Um, when it came to attempted assaults and to threats, we didn't see as much variation, and that's because in general no one was reporting these that much. So we don't see the same variation. Um, but um, potentially as... as these events become more common to be reported, we might also witness that variation across six very similar hospitals. So in terms of the um, talking about the, the most serious events, so this is the sample size for the most serious event. Um, I'm not going to present any of this stratified by the different hospital types. Each of the hospitals that we worked with did receive a report from us where we compared them to the other five hospitals we were working with. Um, but in terms of today, I'm going to just group it talk about the 419 people who gave us some information um, for this part of the survey. So um, in terms of the types of most serious workplace violence incidents that were reported, um, we had 45% of the most serious incidents were assaults, 19% were attempted assaults, and 37% were threats. In terms of the, um, the person who committed the violence, in three quarters of the case it was a patient. Um, and then 11% was it was a visitor to the hospital, and 11% it was a colleague, a staff member, um, and then 4% it was someone else, so it could be someone they didn't know, um, but it could have been a patient. It could have been a visitor, um, could have been a spouse. Um, in terms of the intent to harm, uh, in 33% of the cases they said yes, there was definitely an intent to harm. In 27% of the cases they said no, there was no intent to harm, and in the majority, 40% of the cases, they just weren't sure if there was an intent or not. In terms of some of the consequences, so in half the time people said they felt frightened or worried as a result of this violence occurring. Um, in 37% of the cases they told us they felt psychologically traumatised. In 17% of the cases they were physically injured as a result. Um, in 26% of the cases they said they needed medical care, this was regardless of whether they received medical care or not, they said they needed it. 8% of the time they took time off work, which is staggering when you consider how low time off work is um, compared to the incidents that occur. Um, and then in 4% of the time they required some type of modified duties. We also did a short screening for post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is a scale, it's a seven item question that's been validated um, previously. There's a, I've given the citation here down the bottom. Uh, we asked people, because of this event, did you experience any of the following things? And they tell us yes or no to each of these seven, um, seven different types of events. I'm just going to have got some notes here. Um, in terms of a score of one, so if you say yes to one of these, that has a, um, an accuracy of 75% in terms of a clinical diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. If you say yes to four of these, that has a 96% accuracy in terms of a clinical diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So again, this is just because of this event to do the following. So in terms of our overall sample, in 31% of the time, people said responded to yes to one or more of these questions. Um, and in 8% of the respondents, they responded yes to four or more of these questions. Um, and so again, just 8% uh, of score of four or more is a 95% is um, accurate diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the interesting things here is that you can see in terms of that most accurate level, it actually doesn't differ across the types of violence you've experienced. So although threats are reported less, they're just as likely to lead to some feeling of post-traumatic stress as an assault um, or an attempted assault. Um, in fact, if you were thinking about the event that's most likely to lead to some type of post-traumatic stress, you'd probably focus more on, on threats than you would on, on the other two categories, although they're not statistically different across any of these categories. But certainly as a consequence, um, it's important to capture 
all these types of things because they all can lead to um, important implications. In terms of how did you report this event, so this is by hospital types. Um, so the grey bars here are that they didn't report the event at all, so they didn't tell anyone, they didn't tell a family member, they didn't tell a colleague, they didn't tell a supervisor, they told nobody. Um, the blue, uh, they reported to the hospital system, and the gold, uh, they reported in some other way. These stars here are just to indicate these are the hospitals where we have very, very small um, sample sizes. They're not statistically different to the other hospitals in any other way. They're just, you know, I'd, I'd, use, I'd use these these distributions cautiously because they only barely make it over our, our suppression guidelines for some of the some of the estimates. But again, you can see, in terms of reporting to the hospital system, we go from lows of about 18% in Hospital C to highs of about 35% in Hospital A and Hospital E. Um, again, these are, these are almost twofold differences. Um, and then in terms of not reporting at all, not telling anyone about it, we have differences of about 20% um, here to about 38% here, given that we have another highest value here, but it may not be as, as stable as we would want. But it, it does mean that, again, even across um, these very similar hospitals, when it comes to the most serious event that's occurred, it's reported half the time in some hospitals compared to others. And these are similar hospitals, similar reporting systems. Okay. Just have a yes. clarification question. So for event reporting, could workers choose more than one response, like report to hospital and tell someone? Yeah, they could. So it's so reported to the hospital, and it could also be in another way. So there's some other way here is some other way, but not to the hospital system. So you can't say you didn't report it and say you reported it, but when, when that, that um, orange group is they reported in some other way, and the blue group is the hospital system, and also if they did some other way. So if you reported it to the hospital system and to your and to a colleague and a supervisor, you're in the blue category. But if you said to us you reported to a colleague and a supervisor, but no, I definitely did not put it in the hospital system, you're in the orange. In terms of the proportion of reporting across violent subgroups, so we had 32% of people in our sample who reported their most serious event to the hospital system. 68% did not report their most serious event to the hospital system. It does differ. So similar to what we saw at the very start, when people are assaulted, they're more likely to report than when they have a threat. Um, in the and the Pompeii study, in the Lisa Pompeii study, she had... Um, she found that it was 18% when people were assaulted and 10% when people were threatened. So slightly higher than the US study, uh, but still not, not optimal. When there's an intent to harm, almost half of the respondents report um, their workplace violence event. Or when there's an, even when there's an intent to harm, half do not report their hospital event to the system. Um, to the hospital system. They might report it to a colleague or a friend. When they feel frightened, they're more likely to report when people need medical care, they're more likely to report when they're physically injured, when they're psychologically traumatised, and the highest are when people take time off work, they are likely to report it when they need modified duties. But remember, these comprise 8% and 4% of all the events that occur. So um, so that's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, in the, um, so in the Lisa Pompeii study, she found that uh, reporting was 46% when people were injured. Um, so again, similar... 46% in the Pompeii study and 53% in our study when people are physically injured. Uh, and the Judy Arnett study was 36% reporting in that study when you were physically injured. In terms of the main reason, people said their main reason for not reporting, uh, people could respond to as many of these options as they wanted to. Um, we had uh, options that have been, so these are just ordered from most frequent to less, least frequently endorsed. Um, we've sort of colour coded, gone through a, a system where we tried to colour code similar types of events, similar types of reasons. So, um, not hurt, not serious, not the sort of incident. We've sort of called red. Um, if we sum them up together, that would comprise 62% of our sample indicated who didn't report to the hospital system indicated that that was one of the reasons that they weren't hurt, it wasn't serious, or it's not the sort of event. That's not to say they weren't hurt, it's just to say that that's how they explain their reason and not reporting. Oh, I wasn't hurt. Um, or it, was, it, wasn't a serious, it wasn't a serious thing. Um, 
In terms of the black reasons, these are things around being desensitised. So 32% of people said, I'm just desensitised to violence. 22% um, indicated there's no intent to harm, and 20% and of people said it's just part of your job. And so again, if we sum them all up, that's 54% of the reasons for not reporting it. Something to do with being desensitised or there's, you know, this is part of the job and there's no real intent to harm, and so that's why I, I didn't report it. Uh, in terms of the purple, these are things about being, it's too time consuming to report or I don't have the time, and that's 25%. We also have about 25%, or this is 24%, I said there's no point reporting because nothing ever happens. Um, and we also have other blue ones, which are things about, I was worried about getting blamed. If I report, I just get blamed. Um, I would be blamed for this event, and so I didn't report it. Um, or I was discouraged, actively discouraged from reporting, but luckily they were, they were not as frequent, although we have heard in some of the qualitative work that's happened in the Institute that issues about being blamed and, and training is, is, is one of the factors that influences reporting. Um, and then we have other, other things about, well, my manager knew, or this was already reported as a code white. Um, but you see, certainly the most uh, common reasons for not reporting are things around the, the seriousness of the event, um, things around that is just common in the types of in work in healthcare. Um, there's a bit about time, and then there's also a bit about management responses. And so, if if there was more active responses, or if I knew that a consequence would result, um, then maybe I'd report more. And again, as I was saying at the start, this might be one of the consequences of the new mandatory indicator: is that now that it's publicly disseminated there could be a, more, uh, a greater rationale for people to report because there will certainly be a consequence when there's a public dissemination of what the rate was, or what that count was, I should say. It's not a, not a rate. We asked people as well, what sort of corrective action was taken as a result of reporting uh, the violence? And what I've done here is I've grouped it into those who did report to the hospital system versus those that, that didn't. We'd expect that probably there's more action taken when you do report to the hospital system than when you don't. Um, although you can also report to supervisors and, and colleagues. Uh, we asked people if were adequate protections put in place, was there a root cause analysis done as a result, so that's where you know, there'd be an interview and they're trying to figure out what were the events that led up to this event occurring, was there some type of process improvement put in place so that it didn't happen again, was there a safety uh, plan developed, were you blamed um, as a result? But the most common one that we had found, which was in about 50% of the population, a little bit different in terms of when it was reported, is that I'm not aware of anything that was done as a result. Um, and they had to actively endorse that. It wasn't just that they didn't tell us one of these other ones, it's that they actively said, I am not aware that anything was done as a result of this event. Now, that's not to say nothing was done as a result, it's just to say that the person who experienced the violence wasn't actually aware that anything was done as a result. And again, you can see it does differ. So. When people don't report, they're more likely to say, I'm not actively aware. But still, almost half of the people who reported to the hospital system told us that they're not aware of anything that was done as a result. Uh, but when they do report, it's a little bit more likely that some of these other actions do occur. So then finally, we asked people about their perceptions of workplace violence prevention in the hospital. So we asked this not just to people who had experienced violence, but anyone who participated in the survey. Um, there are differences when you experience violence, your perceptions of workplace violence prevention are lower than when you don't. Um, so we included everyone because we didn't want to skew the, skew the results. Um, so here we have just over 1,100 people who gave us responses to these questions. So we asked them seven different questions. Um, and so here are the seven just listed here. They range from violence prevention as a safety priority to uh, down the bottom, my hospital takes effective action after violence occurs. We have this little item here, uh, the people I work with treat me with respect, and I think a lot of people would look at that and say, that's not really a violence prevention type measure, maybe. But, you know, we were sort of told as we were consulting around the survey that it would be good to include that, to understand that. Um, and potentially when it comes to um, uh, colleague to colleague or staff violence, and maybe perceptions of, of being treated with respect is as an important indicator. So we kept it in, and it does actually... Um, correlate quite well in terms of these other in terms of these other items um, on this scale. So here are the perceptions. So we asked the scale on uh, a Likert scale from strongly disagree, disagree, don't agree, or disagree, strong agree, and strongly agree. Uh, this is the proportion of people who agree with each, with each question by hospital. So this is that violence is a safety priority. Um, 
that management is focused on preventing abuse, management is focused on preventing violence, senior management are committed um, to violence prevention. And again, you can see there is quite a range um, across the hospitals. So we have Hospital A here, who is doing very well. Staff perceptions of violence prevention are higher than um, all the other hospitals. Hospital E here, which is not doing that great um, in terms of lower perceptions than all the other hospitals, with a, with a range in between. And actually, although you can see the pattern in terms of the distribution looks pretty similar um, depending on the question. The only difference you can see is that for each question, the proportion who agree goes down steadily. Um, here's this funny one about treat, being treated with respect. You can see the pattern shifts here a little bit. Um, it could be because it's not directly focused on violence prevention activities. Um, I could report issues and effective actions taken. And again, you can see the patterns that occur. And you would look at this and you'd say, well, Hospital A, I would hope you would say, Hospital A is clearly one of the leading hospitals around violence prevention. Um, and then maybe Hospital E is, is, has some work to do around violence prevention activities. And so to end with, what we wanted to do is, well, let's compare. So let's compare what we would get if we actually ask staff if they've experienced workplace violence. So we did a survey every year in Ontario across every hospital and asked people what would happen if we sort of got those frequencies and put them in across hospital. How would that compare to the hospital report, which is what's going to be publicly disseminated, and then how would that compare to these perceptions of violence prevention activities? Because if they're the same thing, then you're only going to do one of them. But if they're different, then you really should do three of them. So this is the self-reports, which I reported at the start across the different hospitals, uh, the proportion of physical assaults and the proportion of people who experience any workplace violence. Um, these are the hospital reports. The start here is because one of the hospitals didn't give us um, their report, although once it's publicly disseminated on the HKR website, we'll just grab it and fill in that data point. Um, and this is the workplace violence prevention score. And what we've done here is we've flipped the scale so that a higher score indicates worse performance and a lower score indicates better performance and we've made it so this scale could range from uh, 0 to 100. And you can see, um, again, variation across the hospitals in terms of physical assaults, variation in terms of any self-reported workplace violence, variation in terms of the hospital reports, and variation in terms of the workplace violence prevention score. So we can distinguish between the hospitals. However, if we had to rank them, we would rank them differently for each of these measures. So we would, if we were thinking about the hospital reports, we would say, Hospital A, you are clearly one of the laggers in relation to workplace violence. You've got the highest reported rate of workplace violence, and this is comprised of the fact that Hospital A has a high rate of workplace violence, but also people in Hospital A report their violence more. Um, and we'd say, Hospital, hospital F, you know, you're doing quite well, um, and Hospital B, you're not doing too bad. Um, but based on the hospital reports. If we were thinking about workplace violence prevention, we would change it. We would say, Hospital A, you're doing great. You're one of the leaders here, and actually Hospital F, which has the lowest of the hospital reported scores, is actually the second highest in terms of negative perceptions around uh, workplace violence prevention activity. Um, hospital E is consistent. Um, high rates of hospital reported violence, high rates of self-reported violence, and um, higher rates of, of perceptions, negative perceptions about workplace violence prevention. Um, but I think when you've got just six hospitals, six hospitals that are similar in almost every other way, and you can distinguish and change the order depending on the metric, you can imagine what would happen if you started looking at 150 hospitals. Well, I could imagine it. <laughs> I, I, I imagine you'd get more variation. Um, okay, so just to conclude, and then we've got about 15 minutes for questions. So. Um, the strengths and the limitations. So the strengths, it's the first study that we're aware of that is, has examined workplace violence reporting across multiple hospitals um, in Ontario. Um, we have a wide variety of information. I've only just scratched the surface today. We have heaps of other information collected in our survey and if people are interested in that, I'm happy to um, discuss that with people. Um, it does confirm the results of other studies, both in terms of the rates of reporting are very similar, a little bit higher, but um, relatively similar and, and certainly differing in the ways that we would expect uh, based on the two US studies and also the reasons for not reporting are quite similar um, to the US studies. Um, the weakness is the low response rate. Um, we've been engaging with the hospitals and um, also they've 
perceive that as a weakness in terms of their ability to compare themselves to other hospitals um, and we're unable to assess potentially important differences across the hospitals because in some we have such a such a low number of respondents who have reported and told us about their workplace violence. But a low number is better than no number, and some information is better than guessing. So some key messages. Um, so under-reporting of workplace violence is substantial. I don't think anyone could look at the information, 32% of people reporting the most serious incident and say that that's pretty good. Um, so there's about 68% of the most serious incidents of workplace violence are not being reported to the hospital system in our sample. And it does differ across six, six hospitals which are fairly similar in other respects. So they're similar in terms of um, the volume of patients they see, they're similar in terms of the reporting systems they use, they're similar in terms of the size of the hospitals they are, and relatively similar in terms of the areas that they serve. Um, key reasons for not reporting including not being hurt or the seriousness of the event, being desensitised to it and feeling nothing happens as a result. Um, so in terms of increasing reporting, which is one of the things that um, the, the leadership table on workplace violence is looking to do is not only to monitor workplace violence um, incidents but also to encourage reporting of workplace violence across all hospitals. Um, these are the three things you need to focus on but they would require different efforts. So you know, to say to someone we want you to report anything regardless of what happens or who does it to you um, is different to saying and we promise that we will act on it which is another key component of it. And so it needs a multi-pronged approach in terms of encouraging reporting and certainly leadership commitment um, across the hospitals. And these are committed hospitals because they've actually done the survey with us. Um, the relationship between self-reported incidents of workplace violence, between hospital recorded incidents of workplace violence and perceptions of workplace violence are complex. That's another, um, that's a subtle way of saying they don't rank you in the same order. Do not use one as a proxy for the others. If you want to focus on workplace violence prevention, ask people about workplace violence prevention because it's not necessarily the case that the rate of self-reported or hospital-reported workplace violence that occurs will mirror directly with staff perceptions of workplace violence <coughs> prevention activities. Um, and more research with larger samples, should be with, or will, larger samples including the number of participants and also the number of hospitals. So it would be great to expand beyond six hospitals um, is required to fully understand this in more, in more detail. Um, but certainly there's caution that needs to be used in terms of the use of the hospital reports currently as a key performance indicator across um, workplace violence, for workplace violence prevention in the short term. I do think um, certainly the six hospitals who did this with us know that quite well. Health Corps Ontario, I think, knows, understands that quite well. The Ministry of Health and long-term care understands it, the Ministry of Labor understands it as well. The challenge is that the public don't understand it. Um, and certainly, as these rates come out, um, we need to be very careful that we don't start finger-pointing at hospitals who might have a high number of incidents because they've actually encouraged a culture of reporting um, rather than they, they truly do have a, a high number of incidents. So we need to be very cautious. Um, certainly, this year, and even over the next couple of years, there's violence prevention, as, as violence prevention increases and also reporting um, increases, that these rates will change. I mean, they could change based on our information. You could have a threefold increase next year in every hospital and the actual rate, underlying rate of workplace violence would not have changed at all. So that's a scary, a scary thought, which I'll leave you with. Um, <laughs> if you need to keep up to date, on, these are all the links and um, I guess a copy of the slides will be available online as well as webinar. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll open it up for questions and maybe what I'll do because we have so many guests today, um, I will open it up to folks who are visiting the Institute um, and ask you first if you have any questions or comments for Peter. Or any other groups were asked to help increase the sample size at sites? Did you use any, any? Yep. So, yeah, so the question is do we engage with um, professional associations, labour unions in terms of increasing the sample? So, as part of the stakeholder process, 
We engage with some of the labour unions around the content of the questionnaire and the things that they would like to see in the questionnaire. We made them aware that the questionnaire was occurring and we made them aware of the hospitals that which it would be occurring in. We left it to each hospital to determine how they would act with those people in terms of disseminating the survey. And you can see from the differences in the response rates that the extent to which they engage did differ. Certainly, I do think if we went through this again, we would one, do it at a different time of year. Leading up to Christmas is not the best time to do a survey, but I do think we'd get a bit more momentum. In fact, one of the, one of the goals of today's presentation is to increase the awareness and increase some of the momentum around needing to know more about this. And I would imagine that with a, a with better engagement next time, we would do a much better job in terms of the response rates. But yes, at, at the moment we left it, for this survey, we left it up to which hospital to decide exactly how they wanted to engage and disseminate, whether, how often they wanted to send reminders, um, if they had people actively encouraging responses, and so it was, it was on a hospital by hospital basis. Well, I'm assuming you know what the leading sites used to increase it, so those that had the higher response rates, you know that they did A, B, C, and E. Yeah, I don't, I mean, there are... Or you could find out. I could, I could ask them and find out. I mean, I do think, in terms of the leading ones, um, one of them, they made us very aware that they were very active in terms of their engagement and they were going to talk to these other groups. And the other one was not the same, although in chatting with them, they do have a much more integrated approach to workplace violence prevention. Um, so we don't know the extent to which they do. I do think um, the two sides of the highest response rates are much more active around violence prevention and the importance of violence prevention from the CEO down. And I think that you see that as an influence in the response rate that people probably participated because they thought someone's going to hear about this um, at the end. Would be my guess, but I don't. I'm just hypothesizing. Do you have other, uh, Cindy, we have someone from the web? Yeah, I will. I'll come up there so you can hear it. All right. So just a quick question of clarification from someone who was wondering, are the responders all staff or only those in direct care? The responders could be anyone who is on the staff email list. So generally it wouldn't be a physician because they don't, well, it wouldn't be all physicians because not all of them have a hospital email address. We just said to the hospitals, could you, um, can you distribute this on your staff email list? Could you include a letter from someone who's influential? And again, that differed. Sometimes it was someone very high up in the hospital. Sometimes, not that the director of OHS isn't high up, but sometimes it was the director of OHS. Um, so it was just sent as a staff email list and we in terms of the response rates, we're estimating based on the full-time equivalents that are reported both um, on the HQO Compass website and also from the WSOB, we've sort of estimated approximately what the response would, would be based on that. Jesus, more than a clarification. Okay, um, <laughs> so if a another, another question. If a worker reported the incident to a supervisor and the supervisor adds it to the reporting system, that isn't being captured in the system, is that correct? Because a worker has an obligation to report to a supervisor, but not necessarily to a hospital reporting system. So there is an obligation that all incidents should be reported to the hospital system, whether it's done through a supervisor or the worker is. Um, is that just an Ontario thing? Um, oh, it's a bill, what was it, the bill 168 was around. But um, if they did, so yes, so if a worker reported to their supervisor and the supervisor put it in the system and the worker was unaware that the supervisor put it in the system, then the worker would tell us, "I did not report it," um, and they would, they would, um, they would. I guess it would be in the system. I will just go back. We did include that as, as one of the. So twelve percent of the time they said, "Oh, well, management knew it." Now that's not to say my manager put it in. Um, in the Judy Arnett study, um, in that particular study, they actually linked the reports from the surveys to the hospital system. And they found there was a discrepancy, but it evened out in both directions. So there were times that workers are not aware, and then there were times workers think they reported, but it didn't end up. But yeah, for that, I, I don't imagine it would explain the 68% of non-reporting. Um, in fact, in terms of the just the proportion you haven't told anyone, ranging from you know sort of around 43% to 36% across the hospitals, it's that's when someone's told no one at all. But it it is true that if someone told the supervisor and the supervisor put it in and they told us they didn't report, we're counting them as not reporting. Okay. And final question. Um, are joint health and safety committees honed in on this topic and has it resulted in any work refusals? You would have to ask, well, yeah, healthcare is complicated because um, 
the right the right to stop work that's unsafe doesn't apply to, to workers in healthcare, and so it becomes a very complicated situation of what's deemed to be unsafe and can stop work. Um, in terms of are the Joint Health and Safety Committees engaged, um, I think it differs across the hospitals and you'd really need to ask that as a separate question. We didn't get a perception in our survey, we didn't ask them about the engagement of the Joint Health and Safety Committee as part of one of our questionnaires. Um, we do know that hospitals, in terms of the reports, are working in very different ways with their hospitals around disseminating it. Some of them are like, yep, we're definitely going to give this report to the Joint Health and Safety Committee, and some are like, we all think about giving this report to the Joint Health and Safety Committee. Um, and so I think it, it does differ across the hospitals in, in, in important ways. Other questions from the Yes. Um, in terms of a patient initiating something, what, what would be some of the reasons that a patient would initiate some type of a threat or what have you? Are there any examples? Yes, yeah, so we, we asked, so we asked when people reported, we asked what were the, what do you think were the reasons that led to this? Um, so it's usually things like uh, omit care needs, um, it's usually things that they were somehow drunk or inebriated, um, it's things like uh, that they were um, sort of drugged, so they were sort of coming out of a particular uh, procedure and they sort of started swinging, and that's where we've got the difference between the um, intentions, whether people intended it or not. I don't have that information on hand, but we do have that information as part of our survey. Same as when it's a, um, a visitor, like a, to the hospital, we also ask what were the, what were the reasons um, that, that this occurred. And so we have that information, but they're the, the more common ones, I think. It would seem to me, though, that delays in uh, emergency are things that can upset people very much because they see something going on and they don't understand why the Taraj nurse is leaving them behind, you might say. Yeah. And I noticed, unfortunately, uh, a couple of weeks ago, my wife fell in a public place and so they said she had to go to the hospital and they had to call the emergency, but it was at, at about 4.30 in the afternoon on a, on a Saturday and I mean, she was in there zipping out in about in about ten minutes because it wasn't too serious. So it seems to me, just on some of my observations, that time of day, whether you arrive with the emergency or not, could have a whole lot of bearing on how people react to delays. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I think, as I said, we don't. We did ask all those reasons about the differences, although as you can see a lot of it, well, not, not a lot, but are you, so I think there's, and also there's probably differences between what happens in a merge versus what happens outside of a merge. Um, but we do have all that information, we also have information about if people were, um, you know, which area of the hospital they were in and when did it occur, and also when things escalate, so when it starts as a threat and then it proceeds to assaults or attempted assaults, and so um, I have that information, but I don't want to tell you it's definitely mostly this or that because I don't have it the top of my head. Okay, maybe I'll open it up to everyone. Uh, differs a little bit. So some of them have dedicated mental health units as part of the hospital. They would all see um, mental health patients, depending on, I mean, just in terms of the location that they're in. Um, the mental health mix, I do think, so some of them which have a specific, they have, a, they have mental health centres, I think would attract more of that patient population. Um, and so that would make some difference in terms of the incidence of the violence, for sure. Um, and I think that's also, again, something to keep in mind when we start publicly disseminating results across hospitals is, is what, what's the patient population mix. Um, should it differ things around uh, reporting? Um, it probably does in terms of, it does at the moment, because you can see when there's an intent to harm, it's very different. People report that more than when it doesn't, but um, I, I don't think it should necessarily um, change whether it's reported or not, your patient meets and whether there's an intent or not. But certainly that did differ a little bit across the hospitals, although they all did see some um, mental health patients. They all have slightly different ratios of long-term to uh, short-term beds, but um, so there is some of those differences, yeah. Do you know, um, who was your champion at each of the six sites? Do you know, was there 
a difference? Was there off health, maybe risk management, or someone from patient care that were the champions that might have made a difference as well in the response rate? Right? Yes, I think the champions, so the person who sent out the email certainly differed across the hospitals. So I went from um, things like the Director of Occupational Health, including it as an item in the newsletter, um, with a bit of follow-up to someone specifically sending out an email, never the CEO. So if you know you're one of these hospitals, you did not get the CEO sent out the letter. Um, if you wanted to do that next time. Um, <laughs> we didn't get that, but uh, we did get people who were fairly high up at, at sort of director level. Um, with, And again, I think in some hospitals, it was just much more coordinated around, we're going to do this survey, I'm going to send out the letter, can you make sure... You've seen, you tell people that you've seen it. Um, they had a more active workplace violence prevention committees, and so everyone on the committee knew that it was going out, so they would sort of disseminate it as well. And so it differed in, I think, some important ways, and certainly if we were, if we were doing this with actual funding um, and doing it across hospitals with enough time, we would do certain things differently as well. I, it's a two-part question, I think. The, I, the first is just it struck me that looking at the self-reported violence versus the hospital system one, um, can you comment at all, I wonder, on the, the proportion? And Because eyeballing it, it looks like there's some correlation in terms of those that have higher levels of self-reports also have higher levels of the other, and whether there is a narrower range sort of in terms of percentage that get reported um, and whether that's useful at all. And then the, the second, I think it is kind of a second part of the question, um, whether in the reporting systems there's any um, distinction in terms of levels of harm and whether that is something that for the hospitals to be able to track and understand what's going on in terms of, again, changes in reporting, whether that's helpful. Yeah, so, um, so I'll, answer that. I'll answer your question in two parts. Um, in terms of the, yes, yeah, so I think the relationship, the pattern you see around self-reports and workplace violence and hospital reports are similar. Um, you, you would hope they would be similar. Uh, but they do differ, I think, in important ways, and it's influenced from our survey, we would imagine, because they differ in the ways that we would expect based on how many people at the hospital are reporting violence at the hospital. So hospital A... Um, has a very high rate of reporting. Hospital E does not. And you can see here they, they change order quite appreciably. Um, the pattern you observe for, bless you, the pattern you observe for hospital reports, bless you again, uh, hospital reports and workplace violence prevention I think is much more complicated in that you get hospitals which are the highest here, which are the lowest. Hospitals which are the lowest are near the highest. You have one which is consistent, but the ranking shifts around quite dramatically. And I think if we really want to measure prevention properly, we need to measure prevention. And if we want to measure incidence, we should measure incidence. But we shouldn't imagine, because I don't think it's the case, and I might be wrong, it's six hospitals, it might be wider, but it's six more hospitals than anyone else in Ontario has, um, that it's, it, they're not the same. They, they differ. Um, in terms of the second part of your question around consequences, um, as part of the original recommendation was around the number and consequences of violence. Um, it was thought at the time that the recommendation was put in place that not all hospitals would have a system that could accurately capture consequences. Um, all of our hospitals, um, with their reporting systems, do capture some information of consequences. At the moment, there's a group which is led by HQR, which is examining if we were going to capture information of consequences what would be the most important bits of information that we could collect, what would be the most feasible bits of information we could collect. I think one of the challenges is you're thinking of broadly of all hospitals in Ontario, not hospitals <coughs> with active electronic reporting systems. Yeah, and I think it just it comes into that idea of um, the risk of changing over time and how promoting reporting, that idea that if you promote reporting and people get really good at reporting, it looks like the incidence is suddenly increasing, which is not necessary. Oh, and as I said, based on our information, we could have a tripling of the incident next. If we were amazingly successful at reporting, the number of workplace violent incidents would triple next year. And in fact, we, and we could celebrate that <laughs> if we knew that it was, uh, it was all the non-serious incidents that were coming up. We have time for one short question or comment before we go. Does anyone have one? Yeah, 
Okay. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if it's short. <laughs> so I'll that was it. That's good. <laughs> Um, I was really interested in what you were just talking about, about the consequences. And what was happening in my head at the moment was thinking about what the relationship might be around those that are serious, the most serious incidents, how that might relate to what was happening around your measures on post-traumatic stress disorder, and what was happening with the return to work or needing accommodation. And I wondered if you had any comments about, or if you could see any patterns emerging relating to the consequences and the more serious incidents? Well, certainly when the, the... So could I see any patterns around the consequences and the more serious incidents? So certainly I think we didn't, we didn't ask about the consequences for, the, for, in, for things that weren't the most serious incidents, so I can't easily compare those distributions. In terms of reporting, people tend to report more, seri more serious incidents. Um, in terms of the post-traumatic stress impacts, there is no difference between whether you report it or not in terms of that prevalence of the post-traumatic stress I presented. Um, I think one of the challenges around the consequences is that the most, the lowest hanging fruit around that is around lost time claims. We know that the rate of lost time claims in this sector is two per thousand. I've just given you rates of about 40% of people experience, I mean now that's mainly people in direct care and it's broader than that, but I, when there's a 200 fold difference in terms of the estimates I would not be going with the lower estimate. Um, and so I do, that's a challenge, and that's HQO's current challenge, um, and, and I think they're actively trying to figure that one out, and, um, and hopefully we can get up to what would be a good consequence that isn't somehow coloured by everything that happens before you get to actually reporting it as a lost time claim. Thank you very much, and we hope to hear soon from additional data with additional data. Thank you.